Hello, and welcome to the video version of Technology and Space, where we talk about the science, technology, history, and business of space exploration and commercialization. I'm Chris Alvarez, and thank you for watching. I'm speaking with Drs. Jacqueline and Simon Mitten, authors of Vera Rubin, A Life, published by Belknap Press, February 11th, 2021. Thank you both for speaking with me. Thank you for inviting Ron. us. So first, and I'll start with uh, Jacqueline. Um, how did you get into studying and, and writing a book on Vera Rubin? Well, how far back should I go? <laughs> back to when I was a little girl? <laughs> sure, sure. <clears throat> well, I got, I got interested in astronomy when I was very young. I simply can't really remember a time when I wasn't aware of the stars. And it was the stars that attracted me. I, when I was too young, really, to know any, anything about science. But I was fascinated. Uh, I used to look up. Uh, and at that time, uh, there wasn't much by way of streetlights. You really could see the stars. Uh, and that was something that stayed with me. As I went through school and all sorts of other things that seemed exciting. But by the time I was... 15 or 14 or 15, uh, astronomy really had settled as being the thing that I wanted to do. And I had a telescope, a telescope in the backyard. <laughs> uh, and um, so I needed then to study subjects that were going to be relevant. Um, so I read for a degree in physics at Oxford and then subsequently did a PhD in astronomy at Cambridge. Mm -hmm. And um, without going over too much of a, a whole life history, uh, I, did, I did a bit of research, but, but I've ended up really spending most of my uh, professional life in astronomy, bringing the subject to a wider audience, sharing the enthusiasm one way or another. I ended up doing a lot of writing, children and uh, adults, general public interest, uh, media things, working for the Royal Astronomical Society on their press and media things, whole host of stuff like that. Like that. So um, already got quite a few books uh, to my credit. And then the opportunity came along to write about Vera Rubin. And um, I, I was interested in women in astronomy, basically, because, well, I am one. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sufficiently old that going back um, to the time uh, um, when I was trying to be an astronomer, um, I was pretty well regarded as crazy, and particularly for a girl. Yeah. And there were very few women who were doing physics, even fewer women who were doing astronomy. And uh, it, it was something of, a, something of a struggle, I realized later. Um, at the time, I don't think noticed quite in the same way. It was only subsequently, really many years later. So in many ways, I then took up quite an interest in the whole business of women in astronomy, uh, um, right through history, really. Uh, and um, it could hardly have been one of the more prominent women in astronomy than, than Vera Rubin, a great, great heroine, really, of um, many 20th century uh, astronomers, and particularly uh, those of us who have to be female. So, but Simon will tell you a bit more. How about something from him? Holly? Yes, yes, Simon. Yeah, I also um, uh, did physics at Oxford. I was one year ahead of Jacqueline, and uh, we met at the University Astronomical uh, um, Society. Mm -hmm. uh, Oxford was very strong on nuclear physics and for a while I thought I might do it I might do a doctorate in nuclear physics mm -hmm. but then I was advised that it didn't make sense to do the doctorate in the same department of physics uh, as you've done your undergraduate study um, so uh, I switched across to Cambridge and I did a PhD in radio astronomy um, with uh, Martin Ryle and that was a very exciting period because mm -hmm. the radio astronomy group in the Department of Physics had just discovered pulsars mm -hmm. and and so the so the whole department had you know this tremendous 
um, fizz and feeling of doing cutting edge science. Uh, I worked on powerful radio galaxies, um, particularly Cygnus A. And uh, when I finished that, um, uh, basically I moved to the Institute of Astronomy at the University of Cambridge, which when I joined it was run by the famous cosmologist and physicist Fred Hoyle. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was there for a total of probably five and a half years. And that was really tremendously good because the Institute of Astronomy had a big visitor program. And so every summer uh, we got the top, we got the top astronomers um, from Europe uh, and in particularly from the Western United States um, passing through the department. So um, I got to know all these um, famous people, the Burbages uh, and, and so on. A really, really stimulating time. And while I was doing that job, um, gradually I became more interested in the whole idea of um, uh, publishing and writing astronomy books, mm -hmm. rather than competing with dozens and dozens of great minds who were much smarter than I was at doing astrophysics. So I thought, oh, well, I'll go, I'll, I'll go and do something where I can be in the top half. I'll go and be a publisher of astronomy books. <laughs> and uh, I did that for more than 20 years at Cambridge University Press. Um, uh, and uh, at the turn of the present century, 2001, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I decided I needed a new challenge for a third phase of my career. So I went back to being an academic um, and I decided to do research in the history of science, my special field being the history of astronomy and cosmology in the 20th century, partly on the grounds that I knew a lot of the people who'd <laughs> done all the significant <laughs> uh, significant work. It's one of the and, advantages of getting older, isn't it? Actually, uh, you yeah. lived through history. <laughs> you lived through history. Uh, so the first, the, the first serious book I wrote was a biography of um, uh, Fred Hoyle, uh, who died in 2001. And um, that, was a, that was extremely interesting to, to, to write a biography mm. of, of such uh, a fascinating um, um, uh, scientist. So that was, um, uh, that was great. And uh, anyway, time, time, go, time goes by. Mm. So Harvard University Press had been running and does run um, uh, this little series of um, biographies of uh, astronomers and cosmologists, mm -hmm. and um, I received uh, I, I received the first approach from them. Um, we're looking for somebody to do Vera Rubin. Mm -hmm. Now, at the time that that came through, uh, a complication was that I'd got a very a very big contract. Um, to write a history of geophysics and geochemistry. Uh, and I had to finish that first. So Jacqueline and I made a joint proposal to Harvard um, with, with Jacqueline being by far and away the, the senior author on the book and the driving force behind it all um, uh, with me, um, me acting as the sort of uh, loyal supporter and um, a, writer, a writer of three of the chapters which were on extragalactic research. Mm -hmm. But that, that's the story of how we got into it. Okay. So quick aside, uh, Simon, when you were young, were you into astronomy or more into physics? And um, uh, I'd been, I, 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 did, I did an evening class uh, in, uh, in astronomy for one or two semesters. Um, but when I, was in, uh, when I was in the last two years of high school, um, which in England, uh, in the last two years in high school, you concentrate on the subjects you might be going to do in university. Mm. Um, I, uh, uh, I, only did, I only did mathematics and physics, um, and I thought both of them were absolutely wonderful. Uh, and in, and, and in, in, the, in the case of mathematics, I found it so fascinating that by the time we got to the second year, the, the maths teacher just said, look, when I'm, when I'm giving the class, just go and work in the library and come back, <laughs> come back and tell me what you've taught yourself. <laughs> so uh, so, so that, that, that's, how, that's how all of that fits together. Okay. So Jacqueline, um, then let's turn to the book. Um, how did, 
what was your approach to how you wanted uh, the book to be? Is it just sort of a chronological look at her life or is it more focused on themes within her life? Well, actually it's a combination of the two. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I, I've read a, it's a marvelous book, um, not science at all, but we both read it. And so have lots of our friends now, a book called, um, uh, is it the, now I said the title. Um, <laughs> Put you on the spot. <laughs> Travelers in the Third Reich, it's uh, called. I don't know if you've come across this. No. But the author um, made a marvelous job of somehow blending together both a chronology and a thematic approach. And I was just so impressed with how this worked mm -hmm. because the, the thing that I, I did learn from it was she lost a lot of documentation and she had to work through quite a long period of time. And she'd done a lot of research with, of, and it was about a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. and, um, somehow or other, um, you were taken through time but in a thematic kind of way. And I just thought, I wish if, if I could do some, if we could make it work a bit like that. So you've got, a, um, you picked out some of the themes, but the part that really needs to be chronological is chronological. So that's how it ended up really. Um, the first good half of the book is essentially chronological because you're starting with uh, Vera's family, uh, <laughs> and uh, where she was born and how she, where she was brought up and her early education and her early years and so on. And that really is a chronological story. But once she got to her mid thirties and was settled in the place where she was going to work for the rest of her life, then you really need to kind of switch to the thematic side of things because um, it would have been a very dull book if we'd said, um, no, and then she did this and then she did that and, and even if we could have pieced it together so at that stage it was more well what were the big themes in her in her research and that was really the th we agree that would be the three chapters Simon would concentrate mm -hmm. on um, and then the other chapters in the second half was the theme of all the work she did to promote the status of women in astronomy, which was really the other passion in her life, apart from her, um, her absolute love of astronomy and, and, and observing. And uh, that's really a whole standalone story. So we've got one, one very good chapter, I mean, good in length. It's for others to judge whether it's good <laughs> writing, but a, a, a substantial uh, chapter which is all about uh, um, her role in improving the status of women in astronomy. Uh, and then, uh, as one really has to do at the end, there's a bit of a kind of roundup, all the things that you haven't been able to say, all the things about her as a person, and, um, or, or trying to make some sort of sense about what, what her legacy is, how she will be seen and so on. So, um, uh, yeah, so it was a it was very much a, a mixed a mixed approach. I'm speaking with doctors Jacqueline and Simon Minton, authors of Vera Rubin. You can find more information about their work at totalastronomy.com. If you like this episode of Technology in Space so far, please subscribe and hit the like button. If you'd like more books and information on space history or the science, technology, and business of space, check out my YouTube channel. Spacewalks Money Talks, my podcast, Technology in Space, and my website, technologyinspace.com. If you're looking for military history and general history, including true crime, please check out my YouTube channel, War Scholar, my podcast, Military History Inside Out, and my webpage, warscholar.org, or militaryhistorypodcast.com. If you're looking for fiction, including sci-fi, horror, fantasy, mysteries, thrillers, film history, gaming, and more, please check out my YouTube channel, Chris Alvarez Full Contact Nerd, my podcast, Full Contact Nerd Interviews, and my webpage, chrisalvarez.com or fullcontactnerd.com. Now back to the video. What I'd like to add to what Jacqueline has said mm -hmm. is that um, in, the, in the history of science, um, it's quite common for 
the um, writers uh, to pay a great deal of attention to what were the important discoveries this person made, where did they publish their papers, who were their co-authors, um, what did they do next, and what did they do after that, and what did it lead to? Mm -hmm. And that, that is sort of fine if you're doing, if you're doing a, an academic review mm -hmm. of um, everything that a person wrote and published, and you, know, you want to say what their top 10 papers are. Right. Um, but but it's but it's very dull from the point of view of um, narrative and uh, storytelling. You know, mm. writing about history, the clue is in the word history. You've got to write stories, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and you've got to write highly interesting stories because it's his story. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, so, case, yes. uh, and we take we take that very seriously. And, uh, and in fact, um, the more we got into it, um, more it, it seemed very important to convey Vera as a person. This was, it, it's about a person, um, not a list of things that a person did. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, when we first uh, made the proposal, we were very unsure what the material would be that we would have to draw on. Yeah. Um, and in the event, it turned out that that material was much richer and much more exciting than we could have dreamt. Mm -hmm. And that actually made the job of, um, of bringing it to life so much easier and so much more fun as well. It was just um, an amazingly wonderful experience doing the, doing the research. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd probably like to say something about her papers and so on, how we, yeah. how we managed to do all that. So, so Simon, uh, let's talk about the, the scientific discoveries that that she's credited with you know it's not just any any great discovery it's like one of the biggest i think um so can you address address that well i'll start i'll start off um uh vera uh in terms of uh, her area of scientific interest within astronomy um vera became in, in, uh, interested from the very beginning of her career um, with with galaxies um, that wasn't where she actually started because when she was a postdoc um, she had to work for someone else and so uh, she was she was doing work on on solar eclipses but once she broke free of that and uh, had got her own agenda uh, at the um, uh, at the at, uh, yeah once she broke free of that and she got her own agenda she wanted to concentrate on galaxies. Now, uh, when she got into galaxies, there were not that many observational um, astronomers and theorists who were tremendously interested. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course, uh, there had been the great discoveries made by um, Edwin Hubble uh, and so on, but the, the, the whole idea of uh, uh, probing into galaxies and saying, how does the stuff move around inside a galaxy? What's the history um, uh, of a galaxy? Uh, how is the matter in the galaxy distributed? Uh, very few people had taken any interest in this. One of and, the stunning things, of course, is that when you look at galaxies, they're so different. Yeah. They, they, they each have their own personality. Yeah, yeah they've all got their own personality. Uh, uh, the sort of question is, well, why are, why, why are galaxies so different? In some ways, they're the same. You get ones with spiral arms, a lot of them with spiral arms, but every one is immediately identifiable like a face. Yeah. And that was one of the things, wasn't it, that really got her? Yes, it, yes, it was. Mm -hmm. um, and she became interested in the whole concept of um, the stuff that a galaxy is made of. It's, it's spiral arms, it's nucleus, it's mm -hmm. great clouds of, uh, of, of gas. Um, how is this stuff actually moving uh, within and around the uh, the galaxy? And um, she was certainly one of the pioneers in that, wasn't she? Um, well, she was. Uh, and um, importantly, she, uh, she wanted to find out something, some of the things that were very basic about galaxies, um, like um, how massive are they? <laughs> and interestingly, by measuring the movements of the stars and the gas clouds and so on, it's a way of getting a handle on, on the mass 
of the galaxy. It, it actually falls out of the, um, the equation. If you know how fast the stuff is going, um, uh, it tells you something about the mass. Mm. And um, so that was really how she got into that because um, she never started out looking for dark matter. No, she, and she that's... didn't. She didn't set out to investigate dark matter, and in fact, she never really. It, she never really. But that never really took over. It was always about characterizing galaxies. Uh, yeah, and to un to understand Vera, yeah. uh, what what you have to take account of is she was first and foremost an observational astronomer mm -hmm. who wanted to find out about these remote objects called galaxies by measuring their properties and measuring the properties of, of their stars uh, and so on. Um, she was not interested in what the implications were for, uh, for theory. Mm -hmm. Now, in that, she, was, she shared a similarity with Edwin Hubble um, because Hubble's passion was to observe galaxies in order to find their distances. And um, he never joined the bandwagon uh, of what do, these dis what do these distances mean? In fact, um, in his famous book, The Realm of the Nebulae, uh, right on the very last page, um, uh, he says something like, uh, so this is what we know and this is what we understand and this is what we can measure. That's, that, that's what he's saying. And, and he says, um, I will leave airy speculation to others. <laughs> well, <laughs> and, and that was something that Vera said. And, that, and Vera said the same. Vera said the same. Six. But she couldn't escape from the fact that as part of the study of these galaxies, what she found was that when she measured how fast the galaxy was turning on the outer part of the galaxy, it was going around as fast as on the inner part. Um, they, um, there's a technical word for, for, for this, um, because if you, if you say, what is the rotation velocity of all the stuff going around a galaxy um, uh, in comparison with the distance from the center, what you get is a graph called a rotation curve. And the shorthand for saying that um, everything's going at the same speed is that that graph is flat. Now, I make a comparison here. Um, if the, you look at the, the planets going the, around the, the solar sun, system yeah. in the solar system, the farther you are from the sun, the planet that's further out, they travel slowly and they, they take much longer to go around, um, not only because they've got farther to go in their bigger orbits, but also because they simply go a lot slower. And that's part, that's because they're further from the sun, which is the massive thing which is holding it in its orbit. Yeah, so 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 Vera, after she's measured a few of these galaxy um, uh, curves of how the velocity changes with the distance of, of the of, of, of the of the components of the galaxy from the center, um, she turns that uh, into an intellectual puzzle, which, which is um, uh, these velocities are not decreasing um, as I uh, look further and further uh, uh, out across the disk of the galaxy. Um, so there must be some, there must be some reason for that. Um, well, she didn't, she didn't, she didn't, she didn't, she didn't yeah. actually speculate very much on no. what the reason, of the, what the reason was. was. Uh, it, it has it ought to be said as well, just to put the record straight, that it's often said that Vera discovered this, that she discovered about the, the rotation curves. That's not true, and she never claimed that she did. The very first uh, discoveries about the rotation of galaxies and this flat rotation curve was actually made by radio astronomers. Yeah, in the Netherlands. And um, there were, well, there were several. It was, it was Mort, Mort Roberts at the National Optical, um, National uh, Radio Astronomy, Astronomy Observatory yeah. in West, the United States. West Virginia, yeah. Um, was one of the earliest ones. And then by um, a, a Dutch astronomer, Albert uh, Bosma, 
uh, in around 1970. But she was aware of this and Vera had a, actually, she was very interested in using radio astronomy and optical astronomy to make complementary discoveries about galaxies. When she started in the 19, um, 19, late 1950s, early 1960s, radio astronomy was very much still in its infancy. Oh, yeah, yeah. infancy. Yeah, radio. and and um, yeah, so she was quite fascinated yeah. by this. Radio astronomy yeah. was done in muddy fields when she started. <laughs> yes, um, she was aware of this, um, and uh, she didn't. That wasn't. Um, it wasn't that she was necessarily looking for a flat rotation curve, or 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 that anybody, even at that time in the nineteen seventies. Even the radio astronomers were just sort of scratching their heads and being a bit puzzled about it and sort of saying, well, that's funny. We might have expected that the velocities would get less the farther you are from the centre of the galaxy, but they don't seem to be. No. But um, nobody was really sort of thinking why. Hmm. And then importantly, the first one that Vera did was... Um, the Andromeda galaxy, which is the nearest big spiral galaxy to us, sufficiently bright in the sky. If you know where you're looking, you can see it as a, um, a little smudge in the sky. Many people will be familiar with, with we've been able to see that. And certainly you can see the central part of it very easily um, with binoculars. And furthermore, she, importantly, she had a new tool. Well, she went to work at the uh, what was then the Department of Terrestrial Magnetism um, of the Carnegie Institution of Washington. Mm -hmm. um, very recently, it's become part of the Earth and Planets Laboratory, but it's the same, the same place. Uh, and they were developing um, a, uh, an electronic device, mm -hmm. an image tube, which could electronically enhance the the power of the signal that you'll get from a telescope. So it effectively, it was able to uh, multiply by a factor of 10, the, um, the capability of a, of a telescope to, to collect light. Okay. And this meant that with um, a telescope with a diameter of a mirror, say 70 inches, 100 inches, you were going to be competing with the performance of the 200 inch telescope. Mm -hmm. And um, so they just developed this new instrument and she and her collaborator, Kent Ford, who was a long term collaborator, he was the technical expert on the image tube spectrograph. And um, they had a tool that nobody else did. She, she realized that she could do something in optical astronomy that nobody had been able to do before. So they, they looked at the Andromeda galaxy and found that they got pretty well the same from looking at the glowing gas clouds in visible light as the radio astronomers were getting from looking at the radio signals. The, uh, the, point, the point that's worth emphasising is that with this uh, image tube, uh, she, could, she could measure the velocities of stars and gas clouds in uh, in galaxies. Um, she could do she could do it fainter um, than uh, than other competitors, um, and therefore therefore she was able to get she was able to go further out from the uh, galaxy in terms of extending <clears throat> these uh, these rotation curves mm -hmm. uh, and. Um, uh, the, the program which she had of measuring velocities uh, of the different regions in a galaxy was ideally suited to this um, image tube because, as Jacqueline just said, uh, it, it, it meant that with a medium sized uh, um, telescope, uh, you were competing uh, with the telescopes on Mount Wilson um, and, and at Palomar. Um, in terms of being able to measure velocities, not in terms of other things mm -hmm. like being able to take beautiful photographs mm -hmm. and so on, but but for the very specific thing of oh, of measure yes. of measuring speeds, um, uh, it was highly competitive. It was, yes, yes, it was absolutely ideally suited to that yes. to that work. But she so after Andromeda, um, 
in, she, she had a bit of a distraction in, in the early 1970s. They did start to look at whether the expansion of the universe was uniform everywhere, uh, whether there was a deviation from the uniformity. And um, uh, that was, oh, took, took her a bit away from studying individual for galaxies few, for, a few for years, two, or three, yeah. two or three years. And in the end, it turned out that the work she'd done um, didn't survive time because um, it, it, it had been subject to some observational bias. It, uh, it's not worth sort of going over this in great detail. At the time, it definitely stimulated a lot of interest. It was really pioneering work, yeah. even though what she actually did turned out to have had some bias in it. But but that's what science is. That's, well, what, that's, science, what, science is that's like. what science is like. So by the mid to the nineteen seventies, she was back on on this big program of yes, galaxies, and um, uh, that was partly at around this time there was another big development, which was a theoretical development, and um, in the mid nineteen early nineteen seventies, when I'm thinking of. Um, uh, Ostriker and Peebles. Ostriker and Peebles, yeah. And this was really important. Um, so um, Jerry Ostriker and um, Jim Peebles at Princeton University, um, they are they are th theorists, mm. and uh, they were beginning to look at some of the some of this data um, on. The, on the speeds of objects inside galaxies. Actually, that no, no, that no. wasn't what they. It was oh, it, it was pure. It, it was the it, it was the stability. It was the stability. It yeah. was the stability of a of a gal of a spiral galaxy. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Why is the disk stable? Um, what what the question was? Um, uh, if if all, if the only matter that's there is what you can see, what's glowing, the stars and gas, and you've got this whirling. Rotation. Um, rotation of disk of stars, um, it very rapidly be, would become unstable mm -hmm. unless there's some kind of glue or something that kind of mm -hmm. holds it together. Right. And um, they, they produced this really important piece of theoretical work in which they said that um, they considered various possibilities about why galaxies exist at all. Why, why haven't they not torn themselves apart? Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, and they came out and said the most likely, the one that really works, is if their galaxies are completely surrounded by a spherical halo of something, of some matter that we can't see, but is exerting gravity. Yeah. So they were saying, well, that's all very interesting, but we can't see it. So the next thing they were doing then was to say, well, is this astronomically very plausible? We've come up with a theory, but how plausible is it? Um, so they were at that time. People were thinking, well, there could be very faint stars, for example, out there. There could be some form of gas that we aren't quite picking up. But in particular, there could be could be faint stars. And they picked up on the fact that the radio astronomers had found these flat rotation curves and said, well, here's some astronomical evidence that's in support of what we found. And it was the radio astronomers' evidence that they quoted, and um, and they were saying, well, it might be interesting if people started to have a good look around on our own galaxy to see if around our own galaxy there are some faint things that we're missing. Um, so they kind of set the ball rolling a bit, and Vera did then kind of jump onto this a bit, she mentioned it, she referred to the importance of this theoretical work in saying, well, now my, um, by the, the end of the 1970s, um, people were beginning to say, there must be um, something like the, the, these halos. The, the evidence was beginning to, 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 to accumulate and it was the theoretical stuff that really gave it a boost. Um, because uh, um, I think bringing together both the, the the theory and what was then beginning to accumulate as um, observational evidence, this was got what got people really talking about dark matter. Yeah, it, it, it was the first time dark matter had really 
risen to the top of a cosmological agenda since the 1930s. I'm speaking with doctors Jacqueline and Simon Minton, authors of Vera Rubin. You can find more information about their work at totalastronomy.com. If you like this episode of Technology in Space so far, please subscribe and hit the like button. If you'd like more books and information on space history or the science, technology, and business of space, check out my YouTube channel, Spacewalks Money Talks, my podcast, Technology in Space, and my website, technologyinspace.com. If you're looking for military history and general history, including true crime, please check out my YouTube channel, War Scholar, my podcast, Military History Inside Out, and my webpage, warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com. If you're looking for fiction, including sci-fi, horror, fantasy, mysteries, thrillers, film history, gaming, and more, please check out my YouTube channel, Chris Alvarez Full Contact Nerd, my podcast, Full Contact Nerd Interviews, and my webpage, chrisalvarez.com or fullcontactnerd.com. Now back to the video. So it, it, it's, it, it, it's all part of understanding um, uh, um, Vera and how did she operate. So there's this very exciting theory work going on, um, which in, in popular terms is basically saying there's far more matter in the universe than we can see. You know, so um, astronomers have missed most of it, and they don't they don't know what it's made of. Uh, now, um, important point: Vera is not in a university. Um, uh, she's not in an observatory, um, and uh, yes, she's working. She's working at Carnegie, but she's very much um, uh, on on her own there. And she liked this um, quiet existence of just being able to get on calmly at mm. um, Carnegie, work at your own pace, and all that sort of thing. Uh, she's bringing up she's bringing up four children. Bear in mind <laughs> <laughs> um, during this period, and she loved not feeling under. Um, there's uh, at Carnegie. There's never any pu any pressure to publish. Mm. Uh, and so um, uh, she liked all of this. And uh, um, we think that by the time we're in the mid 1970s, there's quite a lot of um, circumstantial evidence that Vera is finding it um, rather scary that there's that there's all this big uh, sort of bandwagon um, taking place. And she's, you know, she's getting phone calls from all over from people saying, can you observe this? And can you, can you observe that? Well, that was really the, the well, 1960s. That was the 60s, yeah. Yes, but, yes. Um, uh, so um, she valued her independence. She valued, she valued her privacy in some sense. Um, and um, she, uh, um, she was, ver she was very, um, she was very modest, wasn't she? In many ways, yes. Uh, I mean, <laughs> he's a sort of. Uh, she had a bit of a love-hate relationship with physics generally because she, yes. <laughs> she'd had such a bad experience with the physics teacher at school. She she never was quite reconciled with the idea of physics as such. And later in life, she used to say, she said in, in an interview, she said, "No, I'm not. Um, I'm not an astrophysicist. I'm an astronomer." Yeah. Um, and she said, I don't need a physics halo, is what, the way she put it. <laughs> um, and, and, so, uh, and, and this was quite true. That, that she, and she said that her, her object was to produce data which was so reliable that other people would absolutely trust it. And this was really why she was influential. Yeah. Why, why was she influential when the radio astronomers hadn't been? And, and still some of the radio astronomers, I think, quite rightly say, well, we did find this first. So why, did, why is it that it's fear of people think about? Well, why is it? And it's, it's because she observed an awful lot of galaxies. Yeah. Over fifth, well over 50. Um, and she was very good at it. She was absolutely skilled 
um, tremendously skilled at, at observing. There's nothing that turned her on more than being in a dome and working in the pitch black, black and in the perishing cold and um, uh, feeling that she was doing a really, really good job. Other people said that she was tremendously dedicated. They'd never seen an astronomer who worked so, so hard. And, and then she set everything out in the papers that she published, yeah. uh, uh, explaining what she'd done very clearly. And, and in those days, um, the, paper, the, the journals would publish photographic plates uh, as part of the paper showing um, the images of the galaxies and the images of the spectra that she'd actually analyzed. So other people could look at that and say, well, I understand that. I, I, I recognize what I'm seeing here. I'm seeing a galaxy and I can see the spectrum. It's all set out in front of me. And she did it for so many galaxies. Now, people still, many people who were optical astronomers or not astronomers at all found papers on radio astronomy, something of a mystery. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so, <laughs> um, so it was in many ways, it was that she, she did what she did so well and she communicated it so well and she did so much of it. And the other thing is that it was Vera herself. There's absolutely no doubt whatsoever. She was a remarkable personality, a remarkable character who um, served the astronomical community uh, in very distinguished ways. And she was just, she was a remarkable person. Um, uh, you know, some, some people have that character, that personality. And um, so uh, she, she came to be known and to be trusted. And um, she served on a lot of very influential committees. Um, and I think very properly so. I mean, some would say that, that, that there came a point where people were recognizing that more women should be involved. Uh, but she was no no token woman, was Vera. She was up there with the tops in, in what she did. And um, so her reputation really rests on something much more complicated about the totality of her contribution and the totality of her personality. Um, and um, this is something that we've tried to set right mm. in the book yeah. because there is a lot of myths or, which wrong attributes the wrong things to her. She mm. was a very great astronomer, but she's been attributed with the wrong things. Sure. And, uh, <laughs> so let me ask, um, what did she do? What was her um, strategy for getting more women involved in astronomy? You know, what, how, what barriers did she want to break and how? Oh, Ooh, you said you are you answered oh, this. Yes. <laughs> well, she she had a wonderful sense of humor, and she was rather good at at, 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 at ironic humor. Hmm. Um, uh, so she brought that to bear. She was absolutely persistent, and um, when I asked uh, uh, one of her former colleagues, a young woman who was a former colleague, about what Vera was like and you know were there any sort of downsides to Vera's character and she said well she was stubborn and this is perfectly true when she got an idea that she she wanted to do something um, she, her persistence and her stubbornness um, uh, carried her through so she quite rightly believed that um, women wouldn't be playing their full role in science unless they were visible. Um, so everywhere where there were meetings and speakers, there should be women speakers as well as men speakers. Every time there was a committee was being elected to represent uh, people, for instance, the committee or the Council of the American Astronomical Society, take an example, that was one of her starting points. Who was going to represent the women? Because when she first got active, it was the, the slate of candidates was all men. Um, when she was elected to the National Academy of Sciences, she just worked absolutely flat out on them all the time. Every time there was a meeting without a woman speaker, somebody got a letter. Every time there was an election and there weren't any candidates, every time they wanted advisors, 
And she was, she didn't just complain, she was very positive because she would say, not, not um, well, there aren't any women. She would send a letter saying, not only are there aren't any women, but I'm enclosing a list of 25 very well qualified women, all of whom would serve very well on this committee or would be good speakers and so on. And she was really, really proactive. And um, she just wrote, she wrote, she wrote letters up the whole time, um, year in, year out, um, saying that uh, she just she just was like a dog with a bone. She would not let go. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, she had yeah, she she sort of had this wonderful sense of, of humor that went that went with it. Um, she also monitored. Um, uh, mentored and supported countless individual women. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, so, yeah. so at what point did she, you, you mentioned that you didn't realize the obstacles you were facing until later, you know, being yes. a woman. at what point did she realize that, you know, when did she decide I need to take a stand, you know, for this? Well, I think, um, she was aware it was it was it was in the early 1970s when she really got going on it mm -hmm. um and i think before that she along with the other women who were making something of a success or, or trying to forge a career um they accepted the situation as it was that is they they did it despite the situation they they weren't actually fighting it they were accepting it and there was very much a situation of, well, women could get on in science as long as they acted like honorary men. Um, <laughs> well, um, and well, this is terrific. Yeah, it was yeah. perfectly true. Um, uh, uh, in fact, girls were offered, were told that I've got evidence there um, from the stuff that had come from the, I think at that time, from the American Institute of Physics about encouraging girls into astronomy. That was in, uh, into, into physics, I'm sorry. Uh, there was in Vera's files booklets saying about how girls had to behave in order to be able to compete with men, and it it was it was very much um, accepting accepting the situation um, rather than trying to change the situation. And she challenged all of that. Yes, one of the one of the very earliest things was. <laughs> she saw an advertisement for um, a job in the uh, uh, well-known uh, journal Nature. Um, uh, we're talking about 1970 here. Yes, yes. And uh, it wasn't a job in astronomy, but in, it had been placed by the, uh, the Australian National Research Organisation. Yeah. Um, and at that time, uh, women were paid uh, less in Australia from... Uh, yes. The same jobs for me done by done by men, and um, uh, it was it was another scientific job. But it it had said, well, if the if the appointee was a woman, um, it would be the, the the salary would be so much less. Anyway, she wrote a a letter to the editor of Nature, who was John Maddox at the time, um, saying uh, suggesting that among other things that. Um, uh, the advertisers, what was it, should... Um, uh, they were discriminating against men. They were discriminating men against men. Because, because, the, because the women were going to undercut the men the, 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 in they get, <laughs> they would be able to get um, uh, a good candidate um, who, who um, for less money if they appointed a woman. And this clearly discriminated against men. <laughs> and, and she suggested... She suggested um, that, that nature should not carry such advertisements. And um, Maddox wrote back to her a very short letter. And I remember it word for word. He said, um, we are all for the women's lib, but unfortunately not all our readers uh, feel the same way. <laughs> <laughs> so you could see why she was beginning to get, get slightly riled at this point. Um, and... Um, uh, then the other thing that happened was the really important thing to happen. She'd spent a year um, uh, on a, uh, her husband got a, a fellowship in uh, uh, California at the university. And she went and spent a year working alongside 
Margaret and Geoffrey Burbage. And Margaret Burbage was something like eight to 10 years her senior mm. and um, already had forged a quite a distinguished career. Um, so she was a role model for, for Vera. Um, and the American Astronomical Society had an award um, which was given to women astronomers. It was set up, it, in fact, it was one of the very first awards they ever had, the Annie Jump Cannon Award. It was endowed by Annie Cannon, who um, was a early 20th century, well-known uh, astronomer at Harvard. And the idea at the time when it was endowed was that this was going to help women in their career, an early effort to do so. And um, Margaret Burbage was um, nominated to receive this award. And she set the cat among the pigeons by turning it down and saying that, although in some way she was honored, it was about time that this discrimination both in favor of and against women stopped. And what the women were saying then was that because it was a special prize for women, it, that they believed they weren't being taken seriously alongside men for other more prestigious awards. Uh, that it was okay, we had a prize especially for the women, you know, it was okay, they, they only needed to compete with each yeah. other. They didn't need to compete with the men. And Margaret Burbage stood up for that. And that just, that was the spark, but it, it released in Vera um, her pent up feelings, which had also been simmering because she'd been noticing that, that there were no women on the council of the American Astronomical Society, but she hadn't felt confident enough at that point to do anything about it because her own career wasn't that well as well established. But as soon as Margaret Burbage um, made that stand, Vera started then writing as well and writing to the AAS and saying that she felt exactly the same way and she got herself very much involved. Then there was a long story, but that started the whole series of events which changed things over time in the American Astronomical Society. Eventually a, a long-term committee um, was uh, a working group who was set up uh, on the status of women, which still exists and is still, is still very active. Mm -hmm. And then Vera also um, staged a protest movement of her own against the Cosmos Club in Washington. I this is funny, yeah. I, don't mm -hmm. know, I, I didn't know about the Cosmos Club before. Um, I, uh, we, we did the research on Vera, but it's a very well-known institution in Washington, D.C. It's on Massachusetts Avenue. Um, and a place which, of course, in those days was an all-male club, mm -hmm. but very much a, uh, a place where um, the great and the good in Washington, in arts, sciences, government, etc., lawyers met and networked, and with lovely facilities that were used for um, meetings and dining, and indeed a lecture room at, at the back of, of, of the building. Mm. And Vera was invited to give a talk on her work on the Andromeda Galaxy by the, uh, the Washington Philosophical Society. And the custom was that the speaker was invited to dinner in the restaurant in the Cosmos Club when the uh, lecture was given in the lecture hall, which had a separate entrance at the back. Mm -hmm. But the policy of the Cosmos Club was that women were allowed to enter these hallowed walls um, as guests, but only if they used a rear entrance known as the ladies' entrance. They weren't allowed to go through the front door. Yeah. And <laughs> hardly seems believable now, does it? Yeah. Anyway, um, Vera said um, she, was, she was not going to enter this building as an inferior person through the back door uh, and that she certainly wasn't going to have dinner there unless she was allowed to go in through the front door. Um, uh, uh, the outcome was that they had dinner somewhere else. The Cosmos Club did change its policy on the door not long after that. Yeah. However, it took them until, we're talking about the early 1970s here, about 1972. It took them an awful long time. It was 1988 when they finally admitted women um, as full members. And that was 
at the point where legislation had changed, so they were going to lose a legal case anyway, so they, they had to do it. Um, sure. So, uh, yeah, so, and she, because she had this, um, uh, she was so cross with the Cosmos Club, she um, uh, lobbied her own employer, um, various astronomical organisations and so on, not to use its facilities. Sure. Is that giving you some idea? <laughs> sure. How she went to about this. So let me ask, um, just for the sake of time, we're coming up on an hour. Um, yeah. How did you, can you talk about the resources you used to do the research for this book? Well, you'd perhaps you'd like to say something about that. Yes. Um, you have to say something about Library right. Congress. The single most important resource was um, Vera's, uh, Vera's papers, which are voluminous. Mm -hmm. um, they're, in the, they're in the Library of Congress. Uh, they take up more than they take up more than 200 storage boxes don't they yes 300 i think yeah and uh this is the, this is the source that we um we used we were we were the first people to be privileged um to be able to go to go through it mm -hmm. uh we had we had fantastic service from the staff of the library of congress mm -hmm. um because when we first made our request uh, um uh uh, at the library, they were they were aware that a lot of the uh, papers had not yet been catalogued, and of course they can't give access to papers mm -hmm. that haven't been catalogued. Um, and uh, uh, they, who, who was it, was on the case? Yeah, they got. The, well, well, they put of, us in touch with the archivist who's yeah, actually the, the doing the processing. Yeah, and the and the the uh, the archivist uh, managed to get all the key stuff catatalogued. Um, uh, in in time in time for the trip, but, but uh, the, we planned the, the first trip. She allowed us to see the half of the material which she had worked on. That's right. And yeah. by the second trip, she she'd finished. Done, she'd done the other. But half. she was tremendously helpful and supportive, and I. Um, it was uh, we got very friendly with her. Actually, yeah, we, we ended did. up contributing a little bit to what went on the um, the, the, the finding guide yeah. and so on for uh, for the papers. So. But the exciting thing in many ways was just, oh, you know, the difference between what people say in their written biographical things or their, when they're interviewed and what's actually in their letters and what happened at the time. You know, it's such a different insight, isn't it? Yeah, the other, um, the, 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 other, the other source, Jacqueline, which you should mention is the, um, oh, yes. is the oral history. Uh, yes. archives. Despite what I've just been saying, you know, it's fact, absolutely fantastic to have those very original um, letters and so on. Um, but the other tremendous resource for which we're very grateful is the American Institute of Physics. Um, uh, their um, archives um, house a program of oral histories which are recorded and then transcribed and um, Vera did, uh, well, she, she'd done, there were three on there originally, and there was another that hadn't even um, been formally onto, onto, the, uh, mm -hmm. onto the website, but we were I was able to um, facilitate that getting there. So there were four big sessions with her. And also we used sessions with other people who'd worked with or, or, or known Vera on that site. And um, again, we were really, really grateful to the work. About a dozen of them, of course. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the American Institute of Physics supports this, this history, uh, history program. That, that was very, very important. There were various other things as well. So what, uh, for each of you, what, um, what, was the, what was the most surprising thing you came across? You know, maybe just a, a you know, big or small when you were researching this. Well, you know what? You know what? I think is it the same one? It's the same one. Yeah, yes, um, yes. Um, we found a we found a long correspondence. Um, thirty years worth. Thirty <laughs> years correspondence uh, between between Vera Rubin uh, and a Jesuit priest, um, McCarthy. Martin McCarthy. Martin McCarthy, yeah. Astronomer. Yeah, he from the Vatican Observatory. Um, and uh, the um, 
McCarthy was old, McCarthy was um, was older than than uh, than Vera, uh, and he did a lot of he did a lot of traveling because um, because he was Vatican Observatory uh, was interested in some of the same things as uh, Vera. Where did they meet? Was it when well, she was at Georgetown? Importantly, yes, we haven't mentioned in all these things that. Um, uh, Vera did her PhD at Georgetown University in Washington, which is a Jesuit foundation. Mm -hmm. And she um, carried on there uh, after she, she gave her PhD in her first jobs. They, they gave, um, the director there gave her the first, first jobs and she became a, um, an assistant professor. And it was there that she met um, Father Martin McCarthy, McCarthy, who came as a visiting professor from the, from the Vatican Observatory for a year. And he taught, he was one of Vera's first teachers on how to observe. Mm, yeah. um, and um, it, a, sadly, the letters she wrote to him didn't survive, but he was an absolutely prolific correspondent. Um, yeah. Much of it in tiny, tiny handwriting, often on, email um, um, airmail sheets um, and so on and um, he was just a person who wrote a lot and um, so it covers all things to do with both astronomy um, their family mm. life his 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 his, yeah, yeah. his life in, in the Vatican yeah even religion from time to time so, yeah which was it you know all the more interesting but, because but, um, Vera um, was culturally yeah. Jewish from but a Jewish the, family. The, these are, the, these days, um, mm. looking at the stuff in the Library of Congress, mm. um, very much here's a co here's a correspondence from another era. Um, this is two people. We've only got one side. We've only got his letters to her. Um, but 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 for thirty years they were very keen pen friends, mm. and they wrote to each other. Now, they're, do, they're doing this at a time when, let's say, international and long distance mm -hmm. phone calls are impossibly expensive. Um, and of course, everything to do with the Internet lies, lies in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, the, the, this, is, this is how people, some people used to behave. And... But why was it even more surprising? And it was partly because um, it was something that Vera had always kept private. Yeah, she always kept quiet. It was it. only after her death on opening up the papers that all this came to light. Nobody really knew. She never spoke about it, even in the oral histories. If anybody asked her about Father McCarthy, she often changed the subject rather hastily. And also um, the family weren't particularly aware that she was uh, such a prolific correspondent they knew him and he was a very welcome visitor he, he um, made a fuss of the children and he was um you know they they remembered him very well as a, as a lovely person um but nobody was really aware of, of this correspondence that had gone on for um, for 30 years so so i normally also ask um what question did did you find most difficult to get an answer for and maybe you did get an answer or you didn't. Um, it, I wonder if these pay, her, her side of the correspondence might be the, the question, but, but you tell me what, what aspect of her life were you most, had the most trouble getting to an answer? Doesn't, didn't, we felt we couldn't answer. I, actually, I haven't stopped to think about that one. No. I, um, uh, I think I would have needed advance notice of that question because, oh, because there isn't anything either of us and say, you no. know, I wish we'd always been able to ask her um, uh, this question or, or you know, despite everything, we, we never found out that, that really intriguing thing about her. I can't, well, I can't well, really uh, think of anything. Yeah, yeah I, well, I can, I can think of something. You see, when we, when we first had the approach from Harvard mm -hmm. and we agreed to work for them on this mm -hmm. wonderful book, uh, our close colleagues, when we, we would say, um, oh, guess what? We've got, a, we've got a contract from Harvard. They want us to write a biography of Vera Rubin. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, uh, what I found was 
that um, the responses I got would be along the lines of, well, Simon, um, uh, if you want to write a biography of a woman astronomer, I wouldn't start with Vera. Um, uh, you know, um, and then they, and then they would and then they would then they would name then they would name um, then they would name some so someone s- someone else. Some sense that her that her her life was boring. Yeah. Um, other people who said, um, well, she's all but been a bit of a mystery to me um, because she never got she, um, she never got she never got hired um, to do uh, a big a big uh, you know director of astronomy or um, whatever at a major uh, at a major university. Mm. Um, uh, uh, it seems very strange to have carried out her whole career at this weirdly named Department of Terrestrial Magnetism, when what she was doing is looking at some of the most distant objects in the universe, you know, doesn't make sense. And we found, mm. we found it did make sense yes. when we went through the papers, um, because it was, it, was, it was because of the peace, the quiet, um, the solitude, um, the, f- the friendliness, um, the, the, the absence of uptight, you know, bossy, domineering people. Um, that's what she loved at Carnegie. She, she, yes, she just loved the place and she thrived there. It clearly mm. gave her the environment that she needed mm. to, to bring out the best in what she got to, to offer. Um, but in many ways, she was not a typical astronomer in any sense of the word. Uh, she, she had a very atypical career. Yeah. But, um, but yes, I, I, nothing really. Um, gosh, I shall think inter- of something <laughs> after we finish this interview. It's a very interesting, I mean, it, all of this is very interesting because she had sort of a non standard approach to so many things and was able to accomplish great things. I think that's one of the fascinating things about what I'm hearing about this biography in her life. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you hope the book will do for readers? What, what would it do for readers? What do you want them to take away? Apart from you know filling the historical gap, you know what, what expectations are you hopeful for? Or what- um, well, I think she is a wonderful role model um, for uh, um, uh, young women who are con- considering whether to do uh, to have a career yes. in science and a, and a, po- and a possibly um, uh, hesitant, uh, particularly of course in subjects like um, physics, chemistry, mm. and engineering, which seems to be very well, m- very much a man's world. She is a she is a tremendous role model in this context of. Um, whatever you want to do, uh, um, set your goal high and uh, yeah. keep at it and be persistent and don't let people, don't let mm. others um, put you off uh, and don't, don't give up the first time uh, mm. you get a set book. So that's, that's one of the things that I hope the book will contribute to. Follow, follow your dream. Follow your dreams. Dream. Kind and of, and kind she, of uh, as a young woman, she said, she, she used to say to herself, will I ever really be an astronomer? And, um, and she proved that, that she could be. Um, and uh, well, the other thing I hope people take away is a much greater understanding of what she really did and why she was a great astronomer. As I said to you, to you earlier, I think that she's been considered a great astronomer by being attributed some of the wrong things instead of all the right things that we really, really need need to know about her. Remember, there are jolly good reasons why um, a very major astronomical facility has been named for her, why a chair has been named for her, and even a feature on Mars has been named for her. So, um, uh, and um, just the sense of sort of fascination as well of of her life, it's... um, uh, I mean, I, I, I wrote it, but I, I think it's a jolly good rollicking story, actually. It's a jolly <laughs> good story. It, it, yeah. I, I mean, it all sort of surprised us, really, that the, the story was as good as it was when we, when we got down to it. And um, the historian, uh, the, the historian in me, I'm, I, I am a professional historian. Um, uh, I am pleased that um, we've addressed something 
that was coming up frequently, uh, people would say to me, well, Simon, one of the things about that book, um, I, hope, I hope you're going to tackle head on the appalling nonsense about the fact that she was never awarded a Nobel Prize. An absolute scandal. Right. Now, um, uh, uh, maybe I'm exaggerating slightly, but you, but, but you get the picture. Yeah. And um, uh, what Jacqueline and I have done in this book, I think, is give a wonderfully um, objective um, and, and positive account uh, um, of her work. And um, uh, we do have the backstory there that she wasn't cheated out of, um, out of a Nobel Prize or anything like that. Okay. Um, uh, she, she, she didn't directly aspire to it. Nobody has ever been awarded a Nobel Prize for anything to do with dark matter. No. Uh, and um, uh, it's kind of interesting that, you know, one, there's only a, there's a Nobel Prize in physics. There isn't one in astronomy. So anything that, that might be in, in astronomy or cosmology or whatever is, is being judged against progress in, in physics. And um, who is to say what the thoughts are of Nobel committees. I mean, they, they've made some quite interesting, but, but sometimes eccentric, what, what some people would say eccentric um, choices in, in, in the past. Um, she, so it's, it's, not, um, yeah. it's not really the, the right yardstick. No. And she, was, she, was, she was nominated. We don't uh, know that. Uh, no one knows. No, well, no, no, no we in one sense, no one knows that. No. no. But there was there was a lot of a, a lot but of the, rumor. the Nobel committees only deal only deal with outside nominations. It is not the job of a Nobel committee um, to say who's thought of this and who's no. thought of that. But it, but the people who are allowed to nominate, if I remember correctly, it's huge. Well, it's uh, it's, it's not anybody. You know, you no, can't no, write it's, in it's, off the street. There, there are three. There are people. there are about three thousand people. Yeah, and there are huge numbers of men. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but really don't think that was the issue. And, and Vera herself said one of the nice things about, you know, if you did get a Nobel Prize, well, no, this was Jocelyn, actually. This is Jocelyn, This yes. was Jocelyn Bell Burnell who wrote the, um, the foreword, but she said, <laughs> um, because she, she, you know, she's, she's had the same sort of thing, saying, well, if you've got the Nobel Prize, well, that's it. Um, nobody can kind of better that. But if you haven't get it, you keep on getting other wonderful you, awards you, instead. You <laughs> Uh, Vera did manage to accumulate nine, nine, honorary, nine degrees honorary degrees and the yeah. National Medal of Science, and she's now got a whole telescope made after uh, her. And she was only the second woman to get the gold medal of... Sec second um, woman to get, get the, gold the gold medal, medal of the Royal Astronomical Society. Yeah. The previous recipient had, had, had received it 160 years before. Before. So she had plenty of... She did have plenty of recognition, and I think possibly recognition that, that was... Uh, that was and still is very well deserved and appropriate to what, what her contribution is uh, uh, and um, uh, her enduring contribution. So, so um, was were there any difficulties in getting the book finished or published? It sounds like it was a pretty smooth effort. Well, you know, book, writing books is always the same. You, you, yeah. you um, you're, we were. Uh, in the end, it took us a little bit longer than we'd originally thought. Yes. Uh, and, and then, you know, there's a there's a, a race up to the um, to the finishing point. Um, it, it was we were f we had to deliver the first the, the manuscript ready at the end of March last year, and uh, we were into COVID lockdown when we were doing that last little bit. Yeah, so. but. Um, uh... Everything after we had handed in our, our manuscript, um, uh, that all went smoothly. And um, uh, Harvard University Press, the, the Belknap Press is one of their imprints. Mm -hmm. So Harvard, Harvard University Press um, um, handled the book uh, um, excellently to our, to our total um, uh, satis sat satisfaction. Yes, we got a lot of help and, and support from from them uh, in seeing through the process. That's all gone, gone very smoothly. And they're working They're working now, you see, it's something that wasn't envisaged when we signed the contract. 
um, which is not being able to do author tours, <laughs> not being able to go and do book signings in bookstores. <laughs> so here we are. Yeah. Uh, so here we are doing this instead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so do you have a current writing project that either of you or both of you are working on together? Um, uh, uh, I've started. I've started doing. Um, yeah, we've we've started doing the we've started doing the uh, the reading, um, and the thinking for um, another another biography, uh, but we're not saying who that is until we've got a publisher lined up. Okay. But it's another it's another it's another intriguing person. <laughs> right. okay. yes. um, so do you have um, do you have social media or website um, that people can follow your works, thoughts, updates, that sort of thing? Uh, our website is www.totalastronomy.com. www.totalastronomy.com. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, and they can they can find stuff there, and they can they they they, <laughs> they can work out how to get in touch with us and all that sort of thing. Yes, it's okay. it's not very fancy. We look after it ourselves when we've got time. So, <laughs> but there is some basic stuff there. <laughs> okay. Okay. Do you have uh, well? That's all the, the questions I have. Do you, either of you have any final thoughts or words? Well, I don't, I can't think you, you've given us a very free hand to say what comes into our heads and uh, you've, you've listened while we, we uh, held forth about Vera, but I think both of us, once, once we've got started now, it's, um, well, we're ready to, I'll get that, with loads to say. The final word I would like to, to say is this, Jacqueline and I had a lot of fun oh. doing this book. And for Vera, on the professional work, it had to be fun. Otherwise it, was uh, otherwise it wasn't worth bothering with. And no. we definitely found that this was fun. It was fun. And, and uh, yeah, it was one of her favorite words. She's like, you know, uh, everything that she did was fun. And she just had such a zest for life. Um, uh, uh, when, um, uh, when one of her children, well, small children, um, and uh, one day he says to her, uh, um, Mom, um, do you have to pay them to go there and work? <laughs> <laughs> she liked it so much. <laughs> because she liked it so much. <laughs> oh, wow. We can, uh, we can all hopefully aspire or hope <laughs> to aspire to reach that, that yeah. level of, of uh, work. Mm. Satisfaction, um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you both for, very much for speaking with me. Well, and thank you very much for uh, letting us say so much. <laughs> cool, cool. Yeah, good stuff, good stuff. Thank you for watching this video version of Technology and Space. If you like this episode, please subscribe for more. If you want daily book suggestions for new science, technology, space, history, and space, please check out my YouTube channel, Space Walks Money Talks, and my website technologyandspace.com. If you're looking for new military and general history information and books, check out warscholar.org, my YouTube channel, Warscholar1945, and my podcast, Military History Inside Out. If you're looking for new fiction and non-fiction books on sci-fi, fantasy, horror, gaming, and more, check out chrisalvarez.com, and my podcast, Full Contact Nerd Interviews. Thank you for listening.